Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is ob obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the, the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today ha I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became a source, the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being de designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. So I mentioned I did go to W and J, and consequently, a third of my classmates are lawyers, a third of them are uh, doctors, and a third of them are underemployed. <laughs> and and because of this, we made I mean yes, we made all the lawyer jokes, right? You know what do you call three thousand lawyers at the bottom of the sea? Good start, all that stuff. But here's the thing: lawyer jokes are are only funny until you need a lawyer. <laughs> And lawyers are like fire extinguishers. They're one of those things that you never need them until the moment you really, really, really need one. <laughs> and then suddenly they become very, very important. Um, and trust me on this. When you need a lawyer, you want a good lawyer. Uh, once upon a time, I naively assumed that most attorneys were basically, I don't know, competent. Turns out, no. <laughs> no, there are bad lawyers. And if you get stuck with a bad lawyer, you're going to have a bad day. Um, I sat through a bunch of trials when I, was, when I worked for the newspaper. I sat through trials, including a few capital murder trials. And um, you'd think that a defense attorney in a capital case, again, there's a possibility that this man is going to be executed. You'd think that the defense attorney would know what he was doing, and you would be wrong. True story. I sat through a trial. In, I once watched an attorney dangle a man's life on whether a porch light was on or off. It was the most irrelevant detail in the entire case. And he spent hours on this. He was sure that this porch light was going to get his, his client acquitted. Spoiler. It did not. Fortunately, the man, in this case, the man was fortunate that he was given life without parole rather than the death penalty, um, which is not exactly a win, but still. So here's your, uh, <laughs> here's your free non-expert, but totally have seen it in real life advice for the day. If you are charged with a crime, pay whatever it costs to get yourself a good lawyer it will pay off, because they do make the other kind. The other kind, the other kind of lawyer. The other kind of lawyer is the kind that asks dumb questions like, and I've heard this, <laughs> were you by yourself or were you alone at the time? That one made everybody in court just stop and stare. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I haven't heard this myself, but apparently this has been said in court. Uh, a doctor was asked, when he was a medical examiner, when he was brought in, was asked, um, how many of the people you performed autopsies on were dead. 
And the answer that was given in court was all of them. <laughs> um, these questions have actually been asked. I heard the first one. I have no explanation for them, apart from the fact that these lawyers were terrible at law. <laughs> and other things, apparently. Um, oh, allow me to introduce you to uh, Kansas ex-lawyer uh, Daniel Hover, whose defense in a capital murder case involved describing his client as, quote unquote, a professional drug dealer and a shooter of people. When your attorney starts saying those things about you, get a new attorney. Uh, actually, the whole case was overturned by the Kansas Supreme Court on the grounds that the lawyer was, and I'm not making this up, inexplicably incompetent. <laughs> so you, you want a good lawyer, it's important. Good advocate. Now that's no less true of judgment before God than it is of judgment before an earthly judge. The same way you don't defend yourself in a capital murder case, you don't want to defend yourself when you stand before God to answer for your life. Let's be honest, you don't have a case. <laughs> I hate to be the one to break that to you. You do not have a case. So, but that's the point of the latter half of Hebrews 4 here and the beginning of Hebrews 5 is that when we stand before God, we need something better than the best lawyer. What we actually need is a high priest. More on the difference that in, in a minute. And you have one. You have a great high priest in Jesus Christ. Now, go back to the Old Testament. Think back, all the way back to Moses and Aaron. And um, you discover that, that in the Jewish mind, uh, priests are actually kind of like lawyers. The priest functioned a little bit like a lawyer on behalf representing the people of Israel before God. The high priest in particular was the, the voice of the people once a year. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest, dressed in all his robes, uh, with, uh, by the way, with bells around the bottom, around the hem, uh, would enter into, once a year, enter into the Holy of Holies, that innermost part of the temple in Jerusalem, and would make sacrifices and pray for forgiveness for the sins of the nation of Israel over the last year. And the bells were on his robe so that the people outside could tell that he was still alive and still moving. Because the fear was that if the high priest slipped up if he did something wrong or if he was insincere that God might strike him dead and he had a rope tied around his waist while he was in there so that he could be pulled out the high priest made sacrifice for sin it was a serious business now Hebrews is a book here we've been reading through Hebrews Hebrews is a book written to Jewish background believers who were under intense social pressure to conform to the old ceremonial law, including the laws regarding sacrifice. We can't appreciate this pressure because we don't, we don't have exactly that. We have other forms of pressure. You live under, okay, you want a modern analogy? Um, I, I, I think it's nothing more pertinent than the present secular orthodoxy regarding sex and gender and those things. But every age has its temptations. In any case, the argument here, which like the rest of Scripture is for you, is that you have one greater than any high priest interceding on your behalf. You have the best lawyer in the universe. And better than a lawyer, you have an advocate. And... Um, And the, the result of having that, that great high priest here in verse 16, and then I'm going to go back a couple of verses and explain how this works, but look at verse 16. It says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that the net effect of having 
a great high priest is that you can approach the throne of grace in time of need with the assurance that you will find, receive mercy and find grace to help you. So that's, that's the effect of having a great high priest. But what kind of high priest do you, do you need? There's a few things that, that this high priest has to be in order to, to really help you. The first thing is, you have to have a high priest who actually knows what you need. You have to have a high priest who knows what you need. Uh, and that should be, in the promise here, is he does. And that should be an encouragement to you. Um, what hinders us in prayer? Because if, if I'm going to sit here and I'm going to talk to you about prayer, you're all silently feeling guilty. Because none of you, nor I, live the prayer life that we know we should. None of us is going with sufficient confidence to that throne of grace regularly enough, seeking that help in confidence. We, um, why not? Well, the simple truth is that very often we don't really see a need to pray because we don't see our real needs. We don't know what we need. We know what we want. We don't know what we need. When in your life do you find that you spend the most time in prayer? When in your life do you spend the most time before the Lord? I'm willing to wager, not that I wager, but whatever, I'm willing to wager that it was a time when you were in big trouble. Maybe it was a time when someone you loved was ill. Maybe it was a time when you were ill. Maybe it was a time when you were in terrible financial trouble or you were in some kind of terrible trouble. That's when we pray the most. That's when we pray the hardest. And why? Because in that moment, we know what we need. <laughs> I need somebody to get better. I need some way to get out of this trouble that I'm in with my bills or whatever it is. I need a job. You know, it's just a real clear need. You see it, you know it, and you take it to the Lord. Well, the promise here is that we may not know what we need, but our advocate, our great high priest, does. And in time of need, we're able to go to him with confidence and find help. Not necessarily the help that we want, but the help that we really need. We need, verse 14, Again, taking it back a couple of verses here. We need an advocate. We need a great high priest. This will sound dumb, but it's pointed out here. We need a great high priest who knows God. It was not enough to put on the robe and to go into the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem there. Because not anybody can be a, 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 the high priest. First of all, there's only, supposed to be only one of them. In, uh, during the time of Jesus, there were some mistakes made in that regard. <laughs> um, you, can't, you don't wake up tomorrow and decide, I'm going to be the high priest. First of all, you have to be a direct descendant of Aaron. You have to be what, what in Hebrew is called a Kohen. So if you run into anybody, uh, just this is Little, little aside, if you run into anybody of Jewish background whose name is Cohen, uh, with an H in the middle, you see Cohen, uh, that is almost certainly a sign that their tradition anyway is that their family were, it was a priestly family. Kohen means priest. Um, yeah, you have to be, you don't get to be a, become a priest. You don't study to be a, I mean, you do study to be a priest, but you don't go to school, graduate, get high enough grades, and yay, now you're a priest. No, you, you were born one. You don't, you, you don't get to use, what good, what good, is, a, what good is a priest who, for, who is not in, in, this, in the Old Testament? What good is a priest who's not an Israelite? It's very difficult. You don't want some Canaanite pagan priest 
going and making sacrifices for you. You need a priest who is a born priest and who knows God. And um, because, so the promise here in verse 14 is since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. What's the source of our confidence? The source of our confidence is that we can now draw near to God because of the, the, the criminal, you, me, has representation. We have an advocate. We have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. The high priest, again, is the one who, who represented the people before God. He's the mediator who made proper sacrifices for people's sins. His ministry made it possible for the people to know and to serve God. But, and this is the point the writer makes here, Jesus isn't just a high priest for us. Jesus is the great high priest, greater than any other high priest. We have an advocate who is with God and who knows God and who is God in human flesh. What more do you want? What more do you want in your representation? Um, why would we ever give this up? And that's the point. Why would we ever give this up? Because we have this. We should hold fast in confidence in our confession. Um, and uh, we need an advocate, finally here, verse 15, an advocate who knows us. So we need an advocate who knows what we need, because he's got to know what to do. We need an advocate who knows God. And we need an advocate who knows us. And that's what it says in verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, the author of Hebrews here is not saying that Jesus experienced every detailed temptation that you will. I doubt that Jesus was ever tempted to run anybody over with a car because, you know, no cars. <laughs> but, pardon? A camel. Is that a temptation? To run over a man with a camel? I do not know. <laughs> that's, if that's a thing that people did, it might be. I... <laughs> ah, man. <laughs> so, chemolecular homicide? <laughs> um, yeah. But, Think about it. Is Jesus tempted to big things? Is Jesus tempted to anger? Absolutely. See it in the Gospels. Is Jesus tempted to try to, to take power for himself? Absolutely. Is Jesus tempted to take the easy way out? Absolutely. Is Jesus tempted not to do what he has come to do? Listen to his prayer in the garden, the night of his arrest. He says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He knows the temptation. Absolutely. And the difference between, the only difference between him and you in this respect is not temptation. The difference is that he experienced this temptation and yet was without sin. That where we get it wrong, he got it right. And um, this is important because, you know, it's tempting to think. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know a little secret of pastoral stuff. Regularly, people come to me, and if you're one of these people, forgive me, um, regularly people come to me and say, Pastor, I have to tell you something. I say, okay, what? I've, I've done something terrible. I said, okay, what? And I'll pray with you, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll try to help you seek forgiveness here. Uh, oh, no, 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 I've done something. You, when I tell you, you'll hate me. I probably won't, unless, you know, I, whatever. 
No, 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 if I tell you, you can never look me in the eyes again because what I've done is worse than any other person I know. All right, spill it. <laughs> and then they tell me something completely mundane. Something really not very interesting. I've had about two occasions in my life where somebody has told me their sins and it actually shocked me. And the only thing that shocked me wasn't the sin, it was that they weren't sorry. Most of the time, so you're, if, when you're tempted, someday you're, you're, you're tempted, you're going to say, oh, you know what, I'm just, I can't, I'm so, I've done such bad stuff, I've been so awful that I'm just worse than anybody else on the planet. It's not true. It's not true. I mentioned it before, every single person in this room, first of all, we have solidarity amongst ourselves because every single person in this room comes into this room on exactly the same basis. You are a sinner. You are a sinner who has heard, or hopefully will hear, the promise of forgiveness and new life and eternal life in the Jesus Christ through his blood shed on the cross. Everybody here is in exactly the same boat. But you also have a great high priest. Your advocate before God the Father, standing before the throne of God, is one who has known every temptation that you have known and is able to sympathize with you in your weakness. You read the 103rd Psalm? It says that he remembers our frame, he knows that we are dust. The Lord knows you better than you know yourself. The Lord knows your weaknesses. The Lord knows what you think are your strengths, and probably aren't. <laughs> and you have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, who knows your need, who knows God immediately, and who knows you in every detail, who has been tempted, in every detail like you except without sin um, you have an intercessor this is, that should encourage you um, finally again back to verse 16 because of those things that's why you are able to draw near you're able to draw near with confidence the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need um, now, it's important here. I, I, I began this with an analogy to a, to a lawyer. And in a sense, Jesus acts that part for us. But he's not called the great high barrister here. He's not called the great high attorney. He's called the great high priest. Why? Because in interceding for you, what does a, what does a priest do that a lawyer doesn't? Well, the answer is the priest makes a sacrifice priest makes a sacrifice for your sins. And as the great, our great high priest is the one who has made the one final, complete sacrifice in himself for your sins and your guilt. Um, the work of the advocate here is the work of a priest. This is our confidence before God that Jesus has shed his blood for us. He's offered up himself in our place. His sacrifice once for all covers our sins, cleanses us, and declares us innocent before God. And because of that, you have this incredible privilege to approach that throne of grace, to find mercy and help in your time of need. Don't hesitate. Go to him. Amen. Our feet.
fears that builds a thorough seas. Tis music in the sinner's ears, fears life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, he sets the prisoner free. So your free mundane life advice of the week is uh, uh, don't, don't try to represent yourself in court. <laughs> Get yourself good representation. Pay what is required. It is worth it. But likewise, do not expect to represent yourself in front of the judgment seat of God. Get yourself good representation. You don't just need a good lawyer. You need a great high priest. And in Jesus Christ, you have one who knows your need, who knows God, who is God, and who knows everything about what you are going through, what you, your, your temptations, your sorrows, your, your needs, your fears. So with that in mind, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, Betty. That's Paul. Good. Yeah.